to talk about today um, is thinking about water security and multifunctionality of uh, water supply chain. So this is work that I've done, but also I had a visiting fellow, um, Juliana, um, came and worked on this, but also a couple of PhD students, Pammy Sine um, and Rebecca Smith. So it's not, it's not just me. Um, so where do we start with water security? Water security is a massive issue. Um, it's a major global concern and there's one of the recent maps up there thinking about baseline water stress. So where it's red, um, obviously that's really, really bad. Um, it's a social concern, it's an environmental concern, um, it's economic, um, it's really impacting lives. So um, in the, the st Sustainable Development Goals, there's quite a lot about water. but. We've got a number of challenges about it. So firstly, defining what it is, and that includes who's impacted, who's affected, how, why. The second thing is linking the very theoretical debate to then practice, and how do we start thinking about managing our water and the flows of water around the world? I'm gonna say that scale, <laughs> world, country, region, um, and link the two, but also thinking, what else are we driving with it? What, what other fluxes are we changing? So it's a huge issue and it's, it's a space where there's a lot of talk about what maybe it means, but we haven't sort of linked that through to action. Um, and again, we need to sort these out and tackle them um, to meet sustainable development goals. And there's a lot in the media and the literature about the mega projects at the moment, where there's effectively a lot of sort of hydraulic modelling done on them. So we can think about the prediction, the modelling, the fluxes, but we haven't really thought about the environmental or the economic impacts much. So where do we start with what it is? 80% we, we, we think really of the world's population face a high level of water security. What that figure doesn't um, include is water poverty. Um, so even in the UK, if we even take the North East, our local water company, Northumbrian Water, are struggling with people not being able to pay their water bills. There's been a lot of hype about people not being paid their energy. That's also happening um, around water. So it doesn't include that. This is literally about getting uh, a supply to those people. Um, but we don't have a definition. Again, we uh, different aspects, perspectives on theory, practice, research, um, have a slightly different definition. And there's many different approaches to this, which again is difficult if you're the person who hasn't got enough water, um, because you don't know which argument to sort of connect to um, or to draw on um, to get your views sort of heard and recognised. And, and then it's really crucial to think that people all should really have the right to an acceptable level um, of risk but also water supply. And that's something ethically and morally that the UN um, are totally signed up to, really. Um, and also, that if we are talking about these mega projects, you might be helping some people, but disadvantaging others. And that's a real concern, I think, in, in this space. So the definitions that are out there, um, I'm gonna put a few up there. Um, obviously, the slides and the presentation will be available, so don't feel you've got to scribble them all down. Um, so the first one is much more framed around access. So everybody has the right to access enough safe water at affordable cost, so you can have a healthy, um, uh, sustained life, but without damaging um, the natural environment. So that's pretty straightforward, and I think the starting definition where most people would, would begin. Um, we then sort of go up a level in uh, putting into that the, the quantity and quality of water, um, but also then with an acceptable level of risk. So we're starting to think about flooding, but also droughts, thinking about pollution of maybe surface water and groundwater. So we're adding another level of sort of intricacy and possibly evidence, data, information into that definition. And the one then from the UN, which is probably the most favoured one then, again, we're adding another whole level of sort of nuance and understanding in. So we've got the, the access to water, we've got something about protecting against pollution and disasters, but also thinking about, um, and this is the bottom bit here, thinking about the, 
the climate of peace and political stability. Because again, there's a lot of civil unrest and wars that are actually going on around water as well. So from these definitions, you can see we need to think about societal needs, which that top one encompasses quite nicely. We need to think about the hazards and the threats and the risks that we might have to our water systems. But we also need to start thinking about our governance as well. Um, and these are things that we, you know, we might not be able to manage all of these hazards. We might be able to do something maybe and think about resilience and vulnerability. But this is an aspect that we do actually have much more control over. So there's two conceptual frameworks that have emerged to think about water security. And these can really sort of be, be thought of as the human development approach and the risk-based approach. So I'm going to just delve into each of these a little bit, really, and see what they are. So the human developmental approach is really thinking about um, society, people, thinking about the capacity we have to live our lives and how we use the environment, um, and thinking about the choices we make. So if we take that premise, we want to then think about outcomes and targets for reforms and for investment. So again, this is starting to guide how we think about managing uh, the water um, and thinking about the crucial role that water then plays. And I think in, in lots of places around the world, we just take it for red that we can turn on the tap and good clean water comes out. That's, that's not always the case. So if you take this, this fundamental approach, you can then think about water security sort of sitting in the middle of a star like this um, and thinking about um, these things around the outside that influence it. So thinking about um, household water security, have we got enough to drink, um, wash, um, clean clothes, things like that. Thinking about urban, and again, this, this mixes scales. So you can go from the household um, then to the whole sort of urban, thinking about environmental. And this environmental is like, how much water does a river need to be healthy? Um, so if we want to support um, fish, organisms, everything else in it, you know, how much, how much is the base level water we actually need in that river? Um, and there's lots of calculations done about what that is. Um, but we obviously want to leave some water in the environment so it can function as an ecosystem. Thinking then about, I've lost my care, so now it's hard to see up there. Thinking about then um, our resilience to water-related disasters and thinking about that in as wide a sense as possible. Um, and then coming back down to our economic water security. Because again, we can make lots of choices. We can move water around a lot. We can make these mega steams, but again, they require a huge amount of investment. So is the benefit of spending that money maybe on hard infrastructure um, worth it to then the people that either win by having more water or lose by having maybe less water. So that's one framework. The other is quite similar, which again we have this sort of web um, of all these things around the edge that then influence our water security. So climate, uh, what's, our, what's our inputs, um, thinking about uh, kind of what we do with it, National security is on there. Water is phenomenally easy to uh, uh, <laughs> interfere with, <laughs> whether you stop supply, whether you pollute it. So that's why you've got national security up there. Thinking about you know, securing these all year round. Again, different in different parts of the globe. If you've got a monsoon, it's very different than thinking about wet all the year round. The relationship to food, relationship to energy. So again, similar idea of a web, but thinking slightly differently about what goes into that web. Um, and the third one there is really, and this is becoming from a sort of economic standpoint, whereas you put growth, well-being um, and at the, at the, at the centre of this, so do we make enough money to do what we want to do, um, thinking about the opportunities, but thinking about the risks, and then trying to balance this between um, what's productive and what's destructive. Um, so you can see these, these frameworks have got a lot of um, things in that influence our, both our demand, but also the threats um, and the opportunities to thinking about this. But at the centre of this, it's all about what water, how much water do we need where. Um, but again, in making those decisions, 
we are we are really valuing and prioritizing different things if that makes sense so the risk-based approach takes a slightly different perspective um, and starts to think about both the the human risks such as what we do to our water do we pollute it do we take more out than we've we've got um, but also thinking then about the more natural hazards so you know what we face with in terms of weather and climate that means we might have a flood or we might have a drought and then we have to think if we're including those risks and those hazards in there um, what are we doing to try and either prepare or manage those risks and hazards so we hopefully are less impacted um, by them and then which means that this third point here is we're starting to think about the hazard the exposure and the vulnerability as measurable quantities now there's quite a debate in those in itself but the idea is that we have hazards but we can we can you know make ourselves more or less vulnerable so an example of this then comes out of the OECD so again it's a very economic based um, approach to understanding it but it is about thinking about achieving and maintaining acceptable levels of risk and they think around these around drought um, inadequate quality excess i.e floods and thinking about the resilience of ecosystems and again they've got their their little diagram down here where we have our sort of target and again this assumes somebody can tell you what is that acceptable level so there's a lot of assumptions in this um, how we manage it you know with a suitable cost you know again how we assess it and then thinking about the feedbacks between them so this is brilliant and it's it's great as a an overall sort of target but actually there's a lot of things in there that are quite difficult to know or to measure or to you know think about are they scalable from a you know a small catchment to the world um, so there's a lot of problems um, rolled up in that so we've gone through three major definitions to two sort of perspectives on understanding it how do we put that into practice so how are these actually operationalized um, to drive maybe some of our thinking or management of water resources um, and that's crucial if we want to work to um, work towards you know doing something about the SDGs we've got to be able to oper operationalize them so to do that we have to recognize that this first one there's many trade-offs exist to ensure our water security um, and it might be that we're championing certain communities or we're deciding to manage certain hazards and, and not others um, but really if we're going to do this we've got to be able to measure and assess um, our water security and that that's quite difficult so really there's only two approaches so far and this is work I've been working on maybe for about 18 months um, and I don't think nothing's really coming out new in this um, so we've got two options one that's by the Asian Water Development Outlook and another um, by Gain et al who published um, uh, a model on this so if we take the National Water Security Index this is a really big idea to kind of try and think about our water security around the world and what's really nice about it is it uses publicly available data so it's not something that somebody is sort of come up with behind closed doors with data that we wouldn't know but we could all interrogate this um, if, if we are interested to do so and it works across different scales which I think is quite useful and quite important so you could use it for a catchment a city a country sub regions of the globe which again makes that feeding into decision making um, quite valuable and, and quite helpful and the idea of this is that it's there to help governments as they decide what they want to do possibly about their resources uh, and their investments and to give them really big aspirations and visions to try and do something about to actually help people and what we end up with we end up with an aggregate indicator score um, that looks across different dimensions so we end up with a value so again that's easy to compare um, and contrast um, and again we, we all like quantitative estimates which I'm not sure it's a good thing or a bad thing but it's quite helpful if you're trying to make an argument about something 
So it takes five key dimensions. So again, these you'll see relate back to some of those early diagrams. But it looks then at your household water security, your economic, your urban, your environment and your resilience to disasters and gives each of those then a score from one to five. And you come up with a table like this. Now I've just simplified that massively, I know. <laughs> um, but what is interesting in this table is you then can, you can get all your um, indicators along the top, you can get a, a whole um, number, but there are numbers here that are sort of underlined where people have had to kind of give a, a guesstimate because maybe the data's not there. Um, and you can then see in, in some of this when you read the text that they've, they've changed some things over time. So you, you can repeat this and, and see how it's changing. So on one hand, great, you've got a number. Great that you can kind of compare them and see who's you know got the most insecure and who's possibly the most secure. But again, it's very, it's very broad brush. Um, but again, maybe you know what is needed to drive thinking at these kinds of very high uh, political levels. So the second one, thinking about the global water security index. Um, this is a bit more spatial. So the idea is, can we map it and do the compare and contrast um, around the world? Again, it comes up with an aggregate um, indice and a number. Um, it's designed to actually be able to monitor SDG and particularly SDG 6, which is the one about sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. Um, thinks about really thinking about the spatial and the temporal variation in water security and is really based on these four, four main criteria. So thinking about availability, accessibility, safety and quality and management. So it's based on very, very different um, estimates than that first one we put up there. Um, and then you can look at the performance of these indicators um, um, you know, against different, uh, different risks and hazards. So quite a different basis and you come out with something like this. So you can think about um, your country and you can see how it maps on certain aspects um, of water supply and, and hazard. Um, and you can think then about its management. So you can see, as you look at those, you can start to see, um, if you take somewhere um, like Australia, um, on the top one, you know, that's performing not badly on all of these, whereas you've got other countries, if you take India here, when you can see something like groundwater depletion, um, where, you know, it's very... Um, bad and they have got big issues and they've got big issues with pollution of their groundwater. So again, it, it, it's a nice way to think about the overarching driving factors. Um, and then you can think with this bottom circle, think about what, um, you know, what's driving it. Um, so down here, if you think about Bangladesh, the quality and safety, um, you know, this doesn't go anywhere along that axis. Um, whereas some of the others, again, you know, United States, much more equal around those four axes. So again, another interesting way of presenting some of that data. Challenges though of this is how on earth do you work out that weighting? So they're prioritising different aspects of this. Um, is that right? Is that wrong? So you can see why this is a good possibility for an essay. <laughs> because there's lots of options to critique here. Also, these indices that we put up tend to be snapshots in time. So you might do it for your data at one moment, um, but it doesn't capture maybe the legacy of possible developments or the change if you put in a mega structure. How does it alter? Um, and it doesn't really think most of these are much easier to apply at maybe a national scale or a regional scale, a global regional scale. So it's not necessarily capturing the changes between regions. And that, again, is quite a problem, particularly as you're dealing with large countries. might not be relevant for the UK because we're effectively pretty tiny. Um, but if you're thinking about China, India, states, they're obviously huge land masses. So the regional variation is really quite important. And on the hand, this is great. This is sort of the theory that gets us to a number. How does this really map onto the way we are choosing to manage and govern um, our water supplies really, and also uh, manage our hazards. So I want to think about what's that relationship. 
Um, and I'm going to put two examples up. So thinking about firstly into basin water transfer in India, so that's quite a large scale. Thinking about using rivers, pipes to move water around um, between um, regions. And then I'm going to think about looking at this in the UK on a much smaller scale and how we understand um, what we're doing to our rivers really and think about how we understand um, our resources. So thinking about interbasin water transfer in India. Interbasin water transfer is not new. Um, there's not that many mega projects, but there's more and more mega projects coming, coming on. So the idea is you take water from a water rich area and you transfer it to a water poor area. And that will then hopefully not degrade the, set, the, the source area, but will actually give many more choices and possibilities in the source area. So this is a map then of the massive links that are then being proposed and being undertaken in India, um, and which are quite scary really, and obviously cost a huge amount of money. Um, so the interlinking uh, project in India has about 30 different links at the interstate and 32 at intra. So it's, it's proposed to shift a huge amount of water, and that's all the links on that map. So what I've done then with PAMI is we've explored just a couple of those links that will function together along with the um, existing um, river network. And so this is where we are. She's, we're then um, in this, this part of India. We've got these, um, this, this set of almost six catchments where they then want to move water between um, up here and, and down here. So we've got two proposed links. And the idea here is that the source areas are then in these orange, yellowy, reddy colours um, and the recipients are then in the, in the green. Um, so it is a huge, large scale and you can just see, thinking about the donor basins, and you can see why people come up with these ideas, that these are pictures taken at the same time of year and the donor basin looks lush and, and green and, and lots of water and already you're thinking about the receiving basin that looks kind of brown and um, not so lush and you know in a state of water so so that rhetoric of just about what the catchment looks like is quite important thinking about these issues um, so what we went away and did is started with thinking about uh, water availability and and they have done some huge feasibility studies um, which we sort of completely disagreed with in this bit of research so we started by thinking about what was the available water resources. So we've got the six drainage basins up there, uh, donors and recipients. Um, we've got the mean daily discharges. They obviously vary slightly across basins. But what you can see is when you look at the quantitative data, you've got similar patterns um, throughout the year. So we've got similar increases, decreases that might be um, slightly different. We can move from that to thinking about daily discharges. Um, and thinking about what we've got around the mean then. So thinking again about the donor and recipients. And what starts to come out pretty quickly here is that you've got a big difference across the monsoon. Interestingly, all the feasibility that was done by the government did it on an annual average. So they weren't even thinking about wet bits of the year and dry bits of the year, um, which is pretty <laughs> unethical. Um, but again, we've got a similar pattern across most of our catchments. Great. You can then start thinking about um, the available water and <clears throat> what we've done here is just taken two. Um, so the brown one is one of the donor basins and the green one is one of the recipient basins and you can plot them against each other and it mostly looks pretty similar really, um, which again is great. But you can then start splitting this across um, the monsoon and then the non-monsoon and again, start seeing at different times of the year what the difference are. So monsoon times, you can see that there's much more water available in uh, source rather than recipients. Come down to non-monsoon, it's much more similar. You can then think about the darker colours each time are then without the link and the lighter colours then with the link starting to operate. And we've done that through a whole series of modelling um, to kind of get a best guess about what's likely to happen. Um, but again, you can see that um, <clears throat> there's not much change and it all looks uh, quite possible really. We can then start analysing that in different ways and think about the comparing this mean daily discharge. Um, 
and think about the water that's required for transfer. And again, fine in the monsoon, looks all right. So this is what's available in brown to go. This is really what they want in green. And this dotted line is then what actually uh, is the required um, water that's kind of modelled from the, uh, from the Indian government about what they'd like to transfer. So it's all right, there's a big difference. So you'd hope that would leave enough resource both for the environment, but also for the people in industry that are in that uh, donor basin. If we then start to think about, gosh, I keep losing this, thinking about the non-monsoon season, it's then quite a different story. So suddenly you haven't got enough water, um, then really the, the donor basin would like uh, to maintain its functionality. So that starts to be a huge concern. And, if, and because they've only looked at it in an, on an annual average, then this pattern hasn't been shown up. So we, we haven't seen this. And again, these two are very close, these two lines. So you know, you'd assume, you'd hope that was uh, still left enough in the donor. But uncertainty is going to be quite huge in these estimates. Um, so it starts to be quite worrying when you break it down uh, at this type of level. <coughs> So if we think about this, this is just a very quick tour of this, um, but if we think about this um, in India in the light of water security, um, we can see that you know, there's, there's a massive plan, um, but if we do undertake a socio-hydrological analysis, so all this data includes like the, the, the weather characteristics, the river discharges, but also demand from the different catchments, um, we can see that on average we've come up with that figure that almost 16% of water available at one of at Gomle will be transferred. That's the proposal. But it's not viable in the monsoon. Even a, a, a relatively simple model, an analysis like this, I shouldn't say that, it took a, a PhD to do, <laughs> but um, has shown that that's really not viable. That it's really uncertain um, in terms of climate variability, let alone climate change. Um, and that these spatial understandings become really important because what we've also done is modelled it through all of those six catchments, which I haven't got time to show you here. But there's some real losers in terms of those donor, donor basins, which are quite worrying. Um, and what, what really inspired PAMI even to do this work was none of this data has been made available to uh, populations and communities. It's been very much a technical report that's gone to government that says actually it's okay to do it. And then the people in the donor basins have had no, no way to even kind of understand the arguments, the data, the modelling, and, and see what the impacts might be. So that's a real map of lack of practice onto water security in maybe India. We're going to think as well about what's been done in the UK. So thinking about trying to link surface water, groundwater, into integrated water resource management. Now... Often surface and groundwater are thought of as very as two different fields. So you rarely you rarely study both. You you if you're a geographer, you tend to mostly just do surface. If you're an air scientist, you might do groundwater. So we don't think about how they come together, um, which is a bit stupid really when you think about it, because you think these you know the the exchanges do interact. So we really need to think, or I'm going to argue that we really need to better understand. Uh, the causality and, and consequence between these two systems to understand how we manage sort of our water flows and fluxes. So we've got a problem we've been working with both the Environment Agency and Northumbrian Water um, and Durham and Sunderland County Councils actually. So it's pretty local to us, it's just out to the east. You can see under this we've got Horton Le Spring, so that's out to the east of us. And what we've got, we've got a big issue here at this Stony Goat borehole, BH stands for borehole. So this is a borehole that's used for drinking water supply. And at the moment, um, I always feel a bit naughty when I say this, <laughs> Northumbrian Water, so our water utility company that do supply clean water and take away dirty water, have got an issue that some of the time they're having to blend this water because it's got too many nitrates in it. So again, they've got to have clean water, they blend with the nitrate-rich water, it's an extra cost. Um, so they want to work out why they've got too many nitrates in this water for drinking water supply. So their, their premise is that we've got this fault line down here, 
and they think something is coming across maybe between these faults or, or getting into the river system here, getting into this fault line where it's moving like a, a motorway through this fault into this drinking borehole. Um, and they want to know what the source area is. So they've been thinking that really um, there's something going on the surface that's getting into subsurface. So then we've had to start an investigation to work out what that might be. Um, so this is where we're based. We're best over and we've been doing some work on this, this Herrington Burn, this river here, um, that they think maybe that they've got nitrates are coming off maybe land use, pollution, and then getting into that fault zone and polluting the river. So what we've been able to do is go back and think about that geology that makes it possible. So we have got these faults available and, and also here we've got a very permeable drinking water aquifer. So we have to be, well, we're very concerned about any pollutants getting into that and damaging that, that drinking water supply. What we've been able to do is to start with to think about mapping out the risk of connection between surface and subsurface. So we've taken that geology map um, and then looked about uh, where we think these connections could happen. So traffic light system on this, so red is high risk, green low risk. And this is all on the thickness of deposits and the geology. Um, so again, readily available data that we can interpret. And we can see then if we've got the river flowing over this, it, it has got some areas where the risk of connection between the surface and the groundwater systems could be really quite easy. And again, if you, but if you take this look at the superficial deposits on top of the geology, lots of this is clay, this yellow area. So we'd expect, you know, the normal assumption of that clay is that it's very hard for water to get through clay because it's very fine particles. So it's almost providing a, a superficial cover that stops that exchange. Um, but again, you know, that's not necessarily the case when you look into the, the detailed understanding of what that, what that, that deposit is. And we've also needed to think then about what is the, um, what is the history of development um, in here above these faults. So we've got a series of faults. This is a very big um, mining area. So over time, there's been a lot of mines that have gone down into some of these fault lines. So again, what other ways have us as humans put these um, you know, connected systems on top of um, these fault lines. So again, they again would be like motorways for getting water through some of that environment. And we need to think then about the legacy of this river and where it has been in terms of that development. So we've done a lot of field walking out up the top here, thinking like that's where any pollution would be getting in. As we're walking over the, over the channels, we're thinking actually there's some un, you know, non-used water channels now. You can still see the, the form of them on the surface. And when you go back to the old maps, um, you can totally see that historically, if you go back to 1850s, 1940, this green line, you can see that that whole river would have extended around this whole new housing estate. So we've got big um, mine spoils down this lower end of the, of the river. Um, but actually, you know, we've changed the course of this river as we've done these developments and thought about how we're reclaiming this mine spoil. And you can follow it through that gradually over time we've chopped that river off and when you walk around the top there you know there's some subsurface sewers that are then coming out of this housing development crossing some of these faults. So again, is it, is it waste from sewers that are coming in that actually we have designed and built <laughs> um, to carry that water or is it maybe agricultural pollution that's coming off uh, at the surface? And we can follow through the development of that river and it's pretty much where it is today. But you can see that if we go back and map, map the historic channel, it started off over here. So that's, that's quite a lot of catchment area we've taken off where it might have been getting surface runoff. But also, if we're building sewers, we might have been building sewers across some of these faults, which again, join up the dirty water with a motorway to get it to a borehole for drinking water supply. Um, we can think again about surface runoff and we've mapped all. These are just surface streams and the areas contributing into it. Um, and again, we can see that we have got quite a lot of surface area as well. So thinking about what land use goes on um, is quite important. But what we've really seen through this case study is we have got 
really uncoordinated development. And that's partly across town planners, but water utilities, environmental management. So it's a complicated story about even design. Um, we've got impacts that haven't been recorded. When we first found those sewers, um, and we took them to Northumbrian Water, and we said, oh, there seems to be some sewer up there. Can you tell us what it is? They were like, no, we haven't got any sewers up there. And they had to go and interrogate their data records to find out what had happened. And eventually we've got it and we've done some dip sampling and there's nothing in it. But again, we're, we're not necessarily very good in this country at recording all our developments and thinking about the change we're creating. Um, so we need to think about the integration. We need to work together across this supply chain of water. We often don't think about these multiple uses. And these can be really detrimental in terms of our water quality, in terms of our ecosystem services, and thinking about that complexity of management. So for something that we think is relatively simple, when you unpick it, almost like with these two case studies, one from India and one the, from the UK, it's incredibly complicated. So you can see how when we think about all that kind of theory about what water security is, how do we capture all of this in that theory? So what we've tried to do is to try and think about how we could portray and think about this differently. And we've got some examples of how uh, me and um, my researchers think we, we could think about water security differently. We haven't necessarily tested it all yet with data, and I can't believe I said that a year ago and I haven't <laughs> done it yet. Um, but it makes us wonder whether these definitions are good enough. So I've got a load of evidence here saying that maybe we're not thinking about this in water security. And also at the outset, I said we need to think about water poverty as well. Um, so do we need different metrics and how should we use them? Um, so we've come up with something that we, we want to test. So if anybody wants to test this for dissertation, I'd love you to <laughs> come see me. Um, but thinking about how can we integrate our theory, our planning and our understanding to come up with something better that would help us see how we're using our water resources. Um, that would possibly, with that second point, think about undertaking an inventory of what sort of water availability we've got, um, that we could then you know, think more creatively about how we use it, um, and join up across maybe these different organisations that are managing it. Um, so we've come up with something we hope thinks about the availability of the water, but also that use, and then and then how we're using it, particularly in industry and particularly with agriculture. So we've been calling this the water mix. And to estimate the water mix, we've been thinking that we really need to think about the different types of water a bit better. And these don't really come into um, the definitions I put up first. So thinking about blue, so thinking about what fresh water we have available that's readily accessible. So that might be in rivers, it might be in groundwater. Thinking about green water, so what's stored in an area that's going to be really a function of kind of the aquifers, but also the root zone. Um, so we can think about that's, that's very much good water, doing good for our environment and our ecosystems. Thinking about grey, and what's really interested about grey, so there's going to be a market in grey water any moment now. So what could be easily cleaned? Um, so thinking about um, stuff from bathing, laundry, not really, really dirty, um, but stuff that could be recycled and reused quite easily. And then thinking about embedded, and there's a whole other discipline really around water that's thinking about how much water is in, sort of making our plastics, um, making our technology, <laughs> and how do we transfer that around the world? You know, is it all right to, um, in a water scarce area, making sure that you grow your crops to feed your your animals, which you then export for food. It's, it's thinking about that idea, that actually, should you be doing that in a very water-sensitive area? Should you be doing things that maybe provide more drinking water for your local um, communities? So starting to bring in those ideas. And then we can assess kind of what water availability we've got and thinking about how the different sectors um, of our economy, including industrial but commercial, but also communities and domestic supply, are using that water um, and then possibly put them into risk categories. So all we've got to at the moment is coming up with some scenarios about how this might work or how it could work. So 
is something like this. So you could actually have on the left hand side thinking about your available water and the right hand side thinking about how you currently use that water. So on the left there this would be a sort of you know example of where we've got a lot of this uh, in blue available water so you think it being a kind of temperate wet wettish kind of a place. Um, we've got a bit there maybe in embedded where we're using that to manufacture kind of products um, and a little bit tied up in green um, and, and grey but then thinking about how we use it so we might have most of it then going into agriculture you know some environmental some domestic so on its own that's okay where this starts to become really useful if you can then compare it with a different region to again see kind of what resource availability you've got and um, how you might be using it so this starts to become an example then of thinking about you know where you are using that resource to to put in very kind of embedded water that you then might be taking out from a region and if you had information like this then that would you know it could I'm not saying it would but it could be used by politicians and governance to think actually we should be making different decisions. You know, are we supporting the correct type of industry? You know, do we have industry really deciding how we use our water rather than thinking about the vulnerabilities of a, a region, you know, deprivation, erosion of the aquifer, pollution of an aquifer, which at the moment, none of that joins up. So it would present information very differently. So what we're doing, we're trying to test that for real data. We've got some data. Of course, what we're then finding is it's an absolute nightmare to get the data, to test it. Um, but even if we can test it on more sort of regional scales to see, see whether that's any good and whether it's any use. So we're in the process of doing that. Um, and, you know, the big questions are in there. Of course, we've just wiped out any discussion of kind of hazards <laughs> compared to those early um, uh, kind of... Uh, thinking I suppose that I put up there but again I think that would be more interesting in terms of usability to drive governance than we've got in some of those other um, uh, kind of theories so what I really wanted to present today hopefully I've done that five minutes over sorry Andres um, but there is really a gap again between the you know something in terms of your thinking which I think is useful to have at the start of the course to say that you've got this gap between coming up with a definition to coming up with a sort of concept and a framework and then moving to being able to actually operationalize it to, to do something with it so you know we've seen that many definitions very few ways of actually operationalizing it um, but again how <clears throat> for me in thinking about those definitions you really need something that helps you think about the choices we're making and the ways in which we manage um, our water resources which again hugely complicated but again we're failing huge swathes of the population around the world because they're not safe and they haven't got enough water um, so you know we need to join that up and think about it thinking about if we do start to see water as a sort of circular economy um, that we need to think about this virtual trade and what those implications are for supply uh, and again for people's vulnerability and some of those big mega products projects rather are just being driven by sort of manufacturing and industry and they're possibly not thinking about who then doesn't have that local source to kind of supply their drinking water but their environments which they might depend on for food or power um, and even for cleanliness and that we need to have some systemic integration across these and I suppose you'd find that across lots of my work um, but again you know we need to join up these different perspectives from different people that have sort of their fingers in the pies trying to think about that decision making and that we need to think about it in our regional development at the moment we're not different countries have different ways of doing it but if you take the UK you know planners make a decision and the water utilities just have to say yes we'll supply the water we'll take away the dirty waste but we actually need to think about that in one kind of decision making um, model I think um, and, you know, obviously we're just starting with the water mix, but I'm hoping we can do a bit more work and um, get it out there. Um, but I think we need to do this because otherwise I think we're not going to be able to do anything about the sustainable development goals. There's lots that's within our power, but I think some of these things we need to think about slightly differently. And that's it. Thank you.